Good evening. Would you please stand? Let's worship the Lord together. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. May we praise you greatly tonight from the depths of our hearts, hearts born again. Stop. 
Lord, we're so blessed to consider your advent, your coming, the word of God made flesh, dwelling among us. And we have beheld your glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Oh, the beauty to think of who you are is overwhelming. The promises you make, they will uphold. Thank you. 
place for a moment. Let's consider the Lord's mercy to us. Lord, we think how time and time again you have lifted us from the dust. You've upheld us despite our falling. When we have fallen, you've raised us up, embraced us, reminded us that we are crowned with loving kindness and tender mercies. You fill our mouth with good things so that our youth is renewed like the eagle. You cause us to walk in newness of life as those alive from the dead. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for quickening, bringing to life the dead, and calling the things that are not as though they were. Teach us to walk by faith. Bless this service. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' holy, precious, amazing name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Okay. You know what the devil hates? Do you know what the devil hates? I'm asking a question. Do you know what the devil hates? This. 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 What's happening tonight. That's what he hates. That's what he hates. So, glad to see you. Glad to be here. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes, thank you, Lord. This is a special moment tonight. Every time we're together, it's a special lot of moments. This is a special moment because we have an ordination. Dr. Thomas Chung, he was, uh, and Natalia, Natalia, are you here? I'd like to recognize you. Now, could you stand up, please, Natalia? Mrs. Natalia Chung. Dr. Chung would have been ordained in June, but he couldn't be here. Um, and I would like to just have a few uh, thoughts regarding ordination and specifically to him and then to all of us. Uh, the first thing related to him is Dr. Chung is a surgeon. And as a surgeon, one who cuts, I know we don't like to think about that, you're going to get cut, make sure it's sharp, right? Um, and sterilized. But 2 Timothy 2.15, speaking to all of us, and then especially to the preachers and teachers, that we are to study to show ourselves approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that word... Uh, rightly dividing is actually a word that means to cut straight. Orthotomeo means to cut it straight. And it really means to cut it straight kind of like the first time. So it, it, it seems like in our studies we are patient, we do the research, we meditate, we consult commentators, we study the languages, original languages, and we kind of, we kind of, that's where we wrestle with it. But when it comes out, it's straight, right? We already did the homework, and before God and by his spirit, what we're saying is, is right. And the prophecy, no prophecy came of any private interpretation. No writer of the Bible said, well, I think I'll say this, or I like that. And likewise, no interpretation of the Bible is whimsical that way. It is what it is, and we need to find out what it says. Right? Okay. So that's the, the surgeon part. But then uh, Dr. Chung is also a naval officer. So we're just going to mention three ships. Everyone on board? Okay. Okay. First of all, it's the sonship. 
and no one gets attacked like the preacher. We need to remember sonship. Behold what manner of love. Behold. Like this is a, a love that is not known here on earth. Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the sons of God, daughters of God. That is a heavenly kind of love that we behold. And when we get shaken and things come against us, we remember this kind of love, the sonship love. We are children of God. Is that good? Amen. Okay, sonship. The next ship is kinship, K-I-N, kinship. In Galatians 6.10, we are of, we are family, and we are the family of faith. We are brothers and sisters, one of another, members of the body of Christ. We're not going this alone. We have kinship. And then it says in Ephesians 2.19 that we are members of the household of God. So look around tonight. This is the family. This is the fam. We are together. It's the family of God. So as sons and daughters of God, we are really never to be alone. But we are to remember the sonship and the kinship. But there's one more ship, and that is the fellowship of the kinship under the sonship. <laughs> because if we're not taking advantage of the kinship, that is every joint supplies. Every family member has something that we need. You've got something that I need. I've got something that you need. And if we can stay on board through this journey of our pilgrimage on earth, we'll come out just fine. So with that, uh, Dr. Chang, would you come forward? And also the elders, the elders that are here, could you come forward so that we can lay hands on Dr. Chung and pray for him? What if we call Natalie up here also to stand beside him? Natalie, Nat Natalia, I'm sorry, Natalia. Uh, that would be Natalia and Daniel. <laughs> Natalia, and that's a good name, isn't it? Daniel. Okay, Natalia, come over here. Okay, we will lay hands. Would you all stand, please? Okay, Father in heaven, we come before you this evening, this very special moment, we are laying hands on your servant, Thomas Chung, with his wife, Natalia, next to him, holding son, Daniel. We commit them to you, to the word of your grace that is able to build them up and to give them an inheritance among them that are sanctified. We pray, Lord, that you would direct his steps, that you would empower him by your spirit that you would use him for your glory. Lord, you have no doubt given him countless opportunities because of where you have placed him. We pray you would give him boldness. We pray that through his testimony, for he is a witness, and witnesses testify. So we pray as your witness, you would bless his testimony in the ears and hearts of those who hear him, those who hear them, and we commit him to you. May you be glorified through their lives. May you, you use them for your glory. May you protect them. May you provide for them. May you lead them each and every day of their lives. And we commit them to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. and amen.
<laughs> Good evening. Well, uh, just for the record, the California governor uh, set a send a stay at home order, and uh, officially, for the record, uh, just prior to coming here, uh, we are here at home. So we followed the rules. <laughs> so. No, we're just, uh, on behalf of uh, Natalia and I and Daniel, we're just so grateful for uh, just the continuous oppor opportunities we have to stay connected with all of you, uh, from the morning devotionals to Grace Hour to the lunch wraps, um, Missions Monday, um, all the Zoom wraps now, um, and the services. And then not just all of that, but just all of the people who are behind the scenes like the AV department and sound and the, the people who, who just are all behind the scenes. We know this is all uh, of work, but thank you. And uh, with that, you know, we're in different times now, obviously. So, and we have no idea where, um, where we're going um, as far as next year, but I'm just gonna say a prayer now for, for, for this church. Father, we just, lift and thank you for this church. We thank you that um, it is your church and you've equipped pastors and uh, the people here with that message of hope of Jesus Christ and the grace that comes with that. And we just pray that you would continue to keep uh, these church doors open, that you would continue this ministry to be strong financially and that that message of grace and love would continue to shine throughout this world. Lord, just we pray a special hedge of protection around this campus, around every pastor and everybody here, Lord, that you would just protect this congregation and the ministry around the world. And we thank you now in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, we, uh, I'm excited to say we still have a, a Bible study with Japan, um, and actually, thank you. So the, we're st this pandemic is actually, we, 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 we have it via Zoom, and Pastor Schaller has actually joined us on a few occasions and some others, um, and we just are loving Japan, okay? And uh, we're, we're going through the book of Luke, and we're emphasizing really the importance of Jesus Christ. Like, why Jesus? There's so many religions out there, and, and J Japanese are, you know, like questioning, why would you say Jesus is everything? And really, we want to emphasize that, that Christianity and Jesus Christ is not a religion. It's a relationship. It's about knowing how much God loves you. There's no other requirement than just accepting him. Really, that's it. It's not a works-based faith. It's a Jesus faith, okay? And um, just think about the, the state of man without Jesus Christ, okay? Number one, you're poor, okay? Poor meaning that you don't really have that true joy. You have not received the eternal riches of heaven, okay? You may think you're wealthy here on earth. You may be a millionaire, okay? But you have not experienced true wealth that comes from Jesus. Number two, you're heartbroken. Everyone who lives is going to go through a period in their lives where tragedy happens, trials happen, we talk in Bible school about uh, the fact that the heart is ultimately broken until Jesus comes in and fixes it. And really, that's, um, that's the, the key thing, is that without Jesus, we have broken hearts, okay? Number three, you are held bound by sin. We unfortunately have a sin nature, and it has held us in bondage um, from really um, just, we're in need of, of 
deliverance, aren't we? Okay, and thank you to Jesus for delivering us. And lastly, um, you, we all live, would live in a prison of selfishness and of fear. So, like, there's so much fear going on right now, isn't it? And the scare tactics of the government, but really, there is no fear in God's love. And um, we just need to help people um, uh, be not blind to the truth of God's love and grace. So one of the, just really quickly, there's, there was an ordination exam question, if you don't mind me saying, Pastor Hadley, um, that said, describe Old Testament scriptures that prophesize of Christ's birth, death, resurrection, and mission. And I thought about that question um, really carefully, and I just absolutely started loving that question um, because it made me think, wow, Jesus Christ had a mission all the way back. Jesus Christ had a mission. Now, if you turn to me quickly to um, Isaiah 61, verse 1, and we'll put that up. Isaiah is prophesying about the first and second covenant here, okay? I'll read it. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Does that all sound familiar? Okay. Next verse, verse 2. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all them that mourn. Okay, so the acceptable year of the Lord, what does that mean? Okay, that is a reference actually to Leviticus. If you look it up, Leviticus 25, it was a time um, when all of the captives were set free. It was after 49 sabbatical years, and the 50th year was the year when captives were set free. Um, it was a time for deliverance. All debts were forgiven, and really it was a time of God's grace and, and, and a celebration of freedom, okay? So Isaiah is prophesying now that there is a day coming when... This is going to happen, the acceptable year of the Lord, okay? So now, um, fast forward now, if you turn with me to Luke 4, verse 16. I should wait a little bit. So, Okay, so Jesus is now here. He's now on earth, and he started his ministry. And where does he come? He comes to his home birth or his, his, his home of Nazareth, okay? And he was in the synagogue, and he was asked to stand up and read. And then in verse 18, he finds a place, and what does he read? He reads this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering the sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised. He specifically read those verses as a fulfillment of the prophecy that was given in Isaiah. And now look um, in verse 19, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Wow. So, and then... Verse 21, and he began to say unto them, this day, this scripture fulfilled is fulfilled in your ears. He's essentially saying that I am the acceptable year of the Lord. I am the year of Jubilee. I am here to set the captives free, to, hold, to, to heal the brokenhearted, to make you rich in Christ and in heavenly riches which you cannot get here on earth. Isn't that amazing that Jesus was on a, on a mission to set us free? And you know, the wise men, we talked about the wise men this morning with Pastor Love, and, and they, were, they came and they worshiped Christ, but they got it. They got it. You know, they gave him gifts of gold, gold because he was a king, 
frankincense because he is our high priest, and myrrh, myrrh, an embalming agent. Can you believe that? An embalming agent. Can you imagine if, if Mary and Joseph didn't understand what was going on, they received myrrh and, and like, oh, here's some formaldehyde for your baby, you know, and, you know, they'd be like, are you crazy? No, they got it because they understood that Jesus Christ would ultimately be the Savior of the world and to pay the sins of all man, okay? Isn't that beautiful? And then, so, lastly, Jesus finishes it in Revelation. If you turn with Revelation 21, um, verse 4, he talks about there not being any more tears and no more sorrow, no more death, and no more pain. Verse 5, he sets on, he sits on the throne, he says, behold, I set, I make all things new. That is what his mission is all about, is to transform our lives, to actually, to set us free from ourselves, okay? Now, and then verse 6, just to close, he says, it is done. Mission accomplished. Jesus has fulfilled his mission in our lives. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and end. And we do have hope. This Christmas season, we can celebrate knowing that we've been set free. And, you know, just there's so many people who are looking to the hope of either, uh, God forbid, their themselves, but maybe their friends, their family, just some hope that's, that, that will get us out of this situation. Uh, there's so many, things, so many things going on with our country and our world with the pandemic. Um, government is not going to set you free. Um, a doctor is not going to set you free. Um, a medicine is not going to set you free. And a vaccine is not going to set you free. The prescription that you need, and this is coming from a doctor, is Jesus Christ. <laughs> that is the prescription. And I'll just close um, with a quick story, if you don't mind. Um, I was a medical student rotating um, at a trauma center, a prominent trauma center in Portland, Oregon. And the, the situation was we got called probably in, in, in the evening, and there was an 18-year-old that had been struck head-on collision by a drunk driver. He came into the trauma bay, and it was clearly he was just broken to pieces. He had his face broken, both lungs collapsed, um, blood in the abdomen, fractured legs and arms. Um, he was immediately rushed to the operating room, and uh, he uh, was sick, okay? So the surgeon uh, the, um, took him back. I was a medical student, so I was just kind of observing. Um, they, they opened him up. He had blood everywhere. They put chest tubes in his, in his chest. Um, and he just he had bleeding from his spleen and it's from his liver, his intestines, everything. It just seemed like, uh, and they were having a lot of problems stopping the bleeding. So after several hours of working with, with this young man, um, the surgeon, now this surgeon was the director of the trauma center director. He had plaques all over, the, all over his office, okay, and he had all kinds of, of diplomas and awards and recognitions. I mean, this guy was, like, key. So I remember distinctly he had, just at one point, he got the labs back from anesthesia and saying that, his, that what his ABG was, his, his blood level. So um, his pH came back at 6.68, and normal pH, if you don't know, is 7.4. So he was really acidotic. His base deficit was 32. He was really basically about to die. So he, he's really tall, by the way. So he, uh, he packed the abdomen um, and just did best as he can to just kind of get it um, stable. He took off his, his scrubs uh, not his scrubs, his gown, surgical gown and his gloves, and he walked out, and I kind of followed him 
And he went out to, outside the operating room, and then I just saw him get down on his knees by the, by the scrub tank. And he just raised his hand and he said, Lord Jesus, please help this boy. He got up, he got back, he scrubbed back in. Somehow he was able to get that, the, the liver bleeding stopped. But I'm telling you, that, that boy walked out a month later. And that had a profound effect on me. But just talking about what Pastor Hadley just shared about the surgeon, really it's, it's, it's not about your ability your skills, your degrees, how much you know, all of what you need to know is who, who has it all, and that is Jesus Christ. It's the power of Jesus Christ in your life that's going to make a difference. And he came with that mission of, of helping people know that. Really, all that's what he wants you to know is really that, that he is there to, to be your advocate. Uh, he is there to set you free from yourself, and he's there to provide love and grace to all of us. And that's what we celebrate now. Amen. Okay. Uh, could we do the song at the end? Yeah, we'll do this song at the end. Okay, what a touching message. What a touching, wasn't that good? What a touching story. Wow. Uh, so I'm going to preach a message now in a minute, so why don't we just kind of stand for a minute and just be quiet or talk to your neighbor or whatever, just move, move around a little bit. Wow, that was amazing.
Okay. All right. So praise the Lord. Well, uh, well, I didn't, wasn't that a good message? Um, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Psalm 68, verse 1. It seems that, and Pat, Dr. Chung, Pastor Chung, let's practice that for a minute, pa Pastor. Um, he mentioned fear and how fear is a strategy of the devil. And in the uh, in these times that we are living, I'm feeling, I was at a gas station and, you know, somebody was waiting on me and, I mean, uh, to get an oil change and the tension, the tension that was there. Maybe it was abnormal, but I feel it in stores um, I feel it with people. And if you think about um, what we're looking at today, and we realize that we are all in a school. We're in a school. And, and I want to direct you to the uh, screen. I think it can go up there. This is uh, from one of my experiences years ago. Maybe you can't see that. That's Finland, do you see it? And across the water is a country called Estonia, which was part of the Soviet Union. And back in 1976, 77, 78, 79, we were invited to preach there. And this was, we went to Tallinn, the capital, and, but this is Soviet times, communism. And uh, I would, Pastor Ben and I went, we have like many stories about it, but I want to describe something to you. That we went to the, we were invited by the Odivesti Baptist Church, which is a historical church in the city, big spire, you know, a lot of people, but there were laws in the Soviet Union uh, like this, you, you, nobody under 18 years of age could go to the church. Uh, another one, uh, no uh, foreign visitors could speak in the church officially. So what were we doing from Finland and also I, I, an American I, going to that church? Well, they had a game that they played. The police were there, the government was there, and then there was an underground, not literally underground, but I would go to the official meeting, and the official meeting, which was run officially, meaning the government, oversight, the pastors, and then there was the meeting with us. And it, and, and it was packed with maybe 100 people in a small room downstairs. And we would go there. And undoubtedly, there was undercover policemen there. And they're watching it go on. And maybe write down my name or know me. And so then I had a growing record and it was um, in the newspaper in Tallinn, Estonia, that I worked for the CIA. <laughs> and anybody who had contact with me, they were then suspect. Uh, so I have this, and I have, I have other, I'm preaching in Uzbekistan. Uh, we're walking towards the meeting. Somebody meets us in the woods. And we can't go. We, we turn around, we go, we go back because the police are there. 
uh, I was preaching in Azerbaijan. Uh, Pastor Mati is sitting over here on my left. I'm in the middle of my message. He comes over, you have to stop preaching now. We stop immediately, take my Bible, walk out. We go out the door. Body members start following us. We go to somebody's home. Meeting was canceled. KGB said the house to stop immediately. They told Pastor Mati, he came and told me. Wow. What world people live in. What is, what is happening in our country? This is a school. Where did those people learn when in Estonia? And what are they learning in different parts of the world? In the school called life. This school, we always kind of think it's over there. But it's here. It's coming home. It's, I don't mean to dramatize or frighten anybody, but I want to bring to the surface some of the feelings that we have about waking up. If a church has been closed for 10 months, what are they doing? Like you want to say hello? What do you believe? What do you believe? What is in your spirit? What is in your heart? I, before I started, I should have said, um, I wrote down a short list of like what happened this past week. Avery uh, Powers and the nativity scene uh, ministry. Pastor Jason, 25 people caroling Friday night. The band concert tonight. Basketball games. Our school is open. Pastor Barry, Pat Lynch, amazing people. Kids have a youth ministry. Um, the ladies, their activities, the cafe, the different things that we do. I love your face, by the way. I love your face. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. The Bible says, greet each other with a holy kiss. Have you done that lately? Or are you afraid? Are you afraid? Judges 7, verse 2. The devil's work is fear. It's fear. And, you know, I didn't preach this morning because I'm so emotional. And I am. I don't know if it's my age or my background or... I pray for me. Pray for me. Because... Wow. Look at Judges 7, verse 2. The Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Right? Lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. Who? You're dismissed. You're afraid? Fear is contagious. Fear is contagious. What is happening in homes with children? I almost wept this morning when I woke up and I thought about a 10-year-old kid. And no names, just the general. 10 years old. He's not in school. It's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. I call to Europe. I say in Finland, are your kids in school? Yeah, schools are open. I called to Hungary, schools are open, not high school, not university, but schools are open for the children. 
Are you angry about it? Are you angry about it? I mean, wow. Fear, fear grows. Do you know that people that haven't been to church for the whole year, do you think they'll ever go back? Or is there fear, is there something about fear we may get it in our childhood in a bad marriage or my dad is an alcoholic and he kicks me around the room. Is that fear leave? Is that a real fear that, that somebody has in life? The psychologists say it sticks with you. It sticks with you. It's unhealthy. It's unhealthy. There are things that are wrong. There are things that I have an issue with. And I'm saying this because I, I want you to know to like a couple of things. One is I'm amazed at our church. I'm amazed. I'm blessed. I am blessed more than anything. We have a great spirit. We have a great heritage and we have a great background. We have great teaching. We have great direction. We have a great message. We have a great mission. Let's throw that in there. Yeah, let's throw that in. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. <clears throat> go, to, go to two more portions. Exodus chapter 1. The king of Egypt, verse 15, spake to the Hebrew midwives. Thanks for your prayers and love spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shifra, the name of the other, Pua. How did their strange names get in our Bible? Pua. Is the Bible forever? Heaven and earth will pass away, but not their names. Their names will not pass away. But did God know the name of the king of Egypt? He doesn't have the name of the king. I know you not. I don't know the king of Egypt, but I know these two women. And he talked to them, and he said, When you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. Yes, sir. 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 No, you better learn to change your language. We are obedient to the authorities. But believe me, the church is not some little sub subset of society. The church is the church of Christ. The headship is Christ. The word of Christ is the spirit of God. It's not the world. The, let's go to the little picture here. Here's a, uh, let's use a white one. Here's a hospital, here's the police station, here's the university, here's the school, here's the health club, here's the, here, here's the rotary club, here's the civil service, here's the volunteer, here's this unit, and then, oh yeah, by the way, Oh, yeah, by the way, like the governor of Virginia just said, yeah, you can worship at home. That's what he said. You can worship at home. We know we can worship at home. We know that. But you're not telling me to stay home. You are not telling me to stay home. I'm not staying home. The king of Egypt, I, I don't even know the guy's name, but I, I don't have... I don't have any respect for those kind of comments. You know? That's, so now you know why you got to pray for me. <laughs> the church, you know, this is, Chuck Colson said it in his, uh, one of his books. I copied it this morning. And um, it was in 1977. It was also the governor of Virginia. I don't have it here. It's okay. Maybe it's better. But anyway, let me, let me point something out. Here's the church. Yeah, it's a nice little group of people. Just stay in your place. Like, you're, the, you're a church. Okay, okay, get over there. Sit down. 
you know, okay, okay, have your prayers. You're not in charge. You're not in charge. You're the church. You're the church. That's all that you are. You're just the church. And, we, and this is how they draw the diagram of our society. That's how they think of it. But how do you think of it? We, all, we have all these great functions and great things that are happening in our society. But the church, I don't know how to draw it. The church is different. That church is not of you. That church is not of your spirit, of your mind. It's not of you. That church is not you. That the government is not the church. By the way, how many decades have we heard separation of church and state? How many decades have we heard that? We are obedient. We pay our taxes and we do our duty. And we've been through this thing for a long time this year. I'm, I'm like, this is who I am. I'm not good at lying. I'm not good at misrepresentations of what I am thinking and feeling. This is where I stand. This is what I believe. This is who I am. That's the way it is, by God's grace. Thank you, Jesus. You know, we, you, I have no... I am so angry. I am so angry about a church with a rainbow flag. That's not a church. That's not a church. Thank you for identifying yourself. And, and I hope you empty out lying, false teaching, false doctrine, many things. Oh, ooh. Okay, let's go back to it. It goes, verse 17. But the midwives feared God. Ooh, wow. That's something that you don't ever hear about in our society. Fearing God. Why don't you drop that around when you are about your business at work and different places? Let us fear God. Fear God. How about in the church? How about each one of us? You know? Wow. It's amazing. God even lets us to be. It's amazing he lets us to be here. He, it's amazing. He is so kind and so loving and so gracious. Wow. They feared God. You fear losing your pension. You will fear losing your reputation. You fear losing your health. You fear dying. I don't get it. I do not get it. How can we live a life when we are afraid of death? I do not get it. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. The devil has authority by the fear of death. Fearing death. It's ridiculous. We all fear death. I don't mean it that way. But the fear of God is more important than the fear of death. The fear of God is more, that's the key to our life, isn't it? The fear of God, they feared God. The, the king said, and they feared God. The king said, kill the baby boys. And it says, they feared God. That's what this world is afraid of. The devil is afraid that you will fear God and not fear him and fear the government, and fear our society, and fear rejection, and fear many other things. He wants us to live in fear. This 10-year-old boy, this, this picture of this kid, what's he doing every day? There's anxiety. There's fear. He can't see his friends. Where's the happiness? Where's the joy? Do you ever see them outside playing baseball? Do you see kids out running around having a good time on bicycles? Where are they home afraid? Are we afraid? Are we people that are fearing and we are breeding fear? Are we people afraid of losing something and we communicate that? Why are you afraid, mom and dad? We are afraid of the corona. What? I, I do think I might need a good walk through a corona award with people on respirators or in a prone position, it may be good for me. But the numbers are so small 
and they are with old people. And if you're a healthy person, and how many people here have had COVID? Just why don't you stand up? We've had COVID. I'm, I'm standing up. Let's all stand up. We've had COVID. Hello? Yeah. Like, here we are. Is there herd immunity or something? I don't know. I don't know. We're working, okay. I was at the club, health club today. I swam this afternoon just to try to get released from my stuff. And in the locker room, I, I said to a guy that I met there first time today, Keith. I said, Keith, have you had COVID? He goes, no. I go, I have. <laughs> he goes, when? <laughs> when? <laughs> so, so I understand, yeah, of course. This is what we are, this is what this is all about. I mean, it's a real thing. It's a pandemic. I'm not under asking, but come on. We are in December. We have a vaccine on the way. Is it time for a relief? Is it, but, but let's back up. What if one day you are in Estonia or Uzbekistan or Russia? What if one day you got, you, your, your life is on the line? By the way, um, um, Kobe Westera, she has a great story when she was a young girl in the Netherlands. This is a beautiful story. She could tell it better than five years old, six, seven, eight years old, I think. Is that right, Pastor Pete? You guys are both worried what I'm going to say. <laughs> You're like, don't do it, don't do it. So in the Netherlands, when the Nazis came in and they took over, the Dutch people have a lot of fight in them and strength in their hearts and mindsets. So the Nazis come in and they're taking over and they're arresting people and so on. And there are Dutch people that are hiding Jews and servicemen, allied servicemen that have been shot out of the air that go into hiding in a, in a Dutch home and everybody's quiet and not talking because they don't know who they can trust. But when the Liberation Armies came in, and she remembers it, and the, the tanks rolled in, and, every, and the people started coming out of their houses and learning from each other, you hid a Jew too? I hid one. And they talk. And guess what? If you're in that school of life and you walk with God and you find a person who has the same, they took the same risk. They, they went out on a limb. They did something contrary to the government. They went contrary to what the Germans were saying, what the Germans were doing, and they were not afraid. I'm sure they were afraid. But they also found who the snitchers were. They also found who the, dis how, who the other side were also. Have you learned a lesson? where you find where your loyalties are in life? Like, where am I landing in these things? Where, where, where am I, what am I believing about my sisters and my brothers? What am I believing about my church? Where am I at in regards to, like, what is going on in this world? Well, God knows, and he sees. And in this chapter, it says that. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt. Let me put in there the Nazis of Germany. And they did not as, the, as Stalin and communist Russia, which was all about that stuff, tattling on their neighbors, you know, this is not good. This is not good. 
but it's rooted in fear. It's rooted in a society that, that somehow is going wrong. And fear is at the very heart of it. If our children are afraid, if a restaurant owner is afraid, if a health club owner is afraid, if a pastor is afraid, if the pastor's wife is afraid, if, if my friends are afraid, where do I go to get my joy and my release? Isn't that our church? Doesn't the church have this spirit that releases me in love? And I learn who God is, and God is God who is love, and he says he casts out love, casts out fear. That's why our spirit of liberty in our heart and in our worship and in our activity is very important to us. I will not cross the street if I am afraid. I will not go to my neighbor if I am afraid. I will not start a school if I am afraid. I will not be a missionary if I am afraid. Hmm. I like to be... I'm not asking a protest. I'm not talking about a protest. I'm talking about something deeper. We are in a school. Have you seen the enemy? Have you, have you seen the enemy? We are in a school. It's dangerous. There are so many foolish things that are being shoved and talked and propagated by many big tech uh, media, social media, many different venues, much arrogance and stupidity on the, in the hearts and minds of uneducated people. Don't educate the people and keep them afraid and keep them in their little world and there will be nothing happening but just demonic activity. Do you know how the Russians drink alcohol? Do you know how much vodka they drink in a week? Do you know the average age of a male in Russia, it was last time I looked, is 56 years of age? The devil is laughing in his sleeve. What a joke. Because I've been there. I know it. I've seen it in Eastern Europe. I lived there 13 years. I know. I've been in those places. I've seen men like me and like you and a drunken just day after day. Fear. If I live in fear, how will I get a release? Vodka. Have fun. Laugh. Talk. Whew, that's it. Wake up. I'm afraid. I'm afraid of life. I'm afraid of the king. I'm, I'm afraid of what's going on. That spirit is, that cannot be in us. That spirit is not of God. That's the thing the devil is afraid of. When you become a man of God, by the way, Billy Graham, 1963, Los Angeles. We heard the message Thursday night. I wanted to play it for you tonight. He's talking about America, 1963. And, and it was so amazing. His passion, his fervency was an excellent message. And maybe we'll do that in the coming weeks. But I'm just saying, you will not have a Billy Graham. You will not have an auditorium packed with people. You will not have any of this Bible. You will not have a preacher with any conviction. You'll, you'll have people afraid. And you, you have a rainbow flag. And foolishness. Foolishness. But if you fear God... You'll be like those Dutch people hiding the Jews and not fear the king. And you'll do it. And this is what God did to them. He says this, verse 18, the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said, why have you done this thing and have saved the men's children alive? And the midwife said, Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women. I want to throw in there a parallel. Why did you save them? Because those women, they're not like other women. What does it mean? Those believers are not like other people. Those people, those believers at Fed Hill, 
They're not like other people. There's people, that, those believers that have it in grace in Brooklyn, New York, and Chicago. They're not like other people. And, and by the way, John MacArthur uh, out there in uh, Los Angeles, he is not like other people. He's like, I'm, I like that guy. I like, his, I like him. First Amendment protects us. And if we, even without the First Amendment, this is who we are. And we are the kind that get it. When the, when the powers come, we're the first ones to go to the camps and go to the prisons and the whole thing. And I'm not, I'm, please mis don't misunderstand me. I'm, I'm not talking about us now this time. I don't know, and, and I don't want to alarm, and I'm not a conspiracy theory guy. I'm not into the news a lot. This is just in, in, my, in me at the moment, and we'll get through it. And maybe it helps you. Hey, wow. I feel strongly about it. I do. I'm so angry. I'm so angry, and it's not going to go away. If it's from God, it's not going away. I am so angry. I am so angry. Where, where are the men of God? Where are the pastors that are preaching like this and, and ministering to people and lead them in the truth? We are going to meet Jesus Christ one day. But no, we're closed down. Our churches are closed. Well, wow. Wow. How, what? How can, what do you, <laughs> wow, wow, oh. stupid, stupid. Kids, stupid, restaurants closed, Baltimore City, like stupid, churches closed, stupid, like a lot of stupidity, the whole thing, I'm fed up with it, I'm fed up with it, don't even talk to me about it, I am so angry about it. For the last 11 months, 10 months, we teach the fear of God. We live in the fear of God, and you guys are awesome. So I'm preaching to the internet audience and anybody that's uh, is hearing me and, and so on. The, you guys are awesome. I'm so glad we are here. I'm so thankful for the Spirit of God amongst us. But don't talk, don't, don't, don't even, don't push my buttons. <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay, let's go to it. Verse uh, 19. The Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women. Let's say that to each other. The Hebrew women, just turn to your neighbor. The Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively. Any, any, any single guys here get married to the Hebrew women? They are lively and are delivered before the midwives come in unto them. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives. What? He, dwell, he dealt w well with them. He honored them, didn't he? He showered them. Sometimes when you read about some old saint of God, 93 years old, 100 years old, you think, how did they live? It may be just God did it. Of course he did it. God did it. God dealt well with them. It can happen. Really, with different ways. What did he do? Didn't he give them houses? And it came to pass because the midwives feared God that he made them houses. God built them like, uh, you know, condominiums and stuff. <laughs> he made them houses. I think it's, uh, I don't know, is it households? It's in the Hebrew. Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. I wonder how many Christians would do that. You'll throw them in the river. I don't know. I wonder how many Christians have been that know the Bible enough to say, and know God enough to say, that I, I, the, even if the king said that, I will not do that. 
How many Christians know enough in this world to say that I, I want to have joy, I want purpose, I want to be, uh, I want to uh, evangelize, I want to serve, I want to love the brethren. Uh, so. That's it. What are the three things we learn in the school that we are in? Number one, we learn who our enemies are. I need to know who my enemies are. That's one. That's Number two, I want to learn Christ. I want to follow him. I want to learn worship, like Pastor Love said this morning, that the, that the wise men went and worshiped. And, and Herod, Herod, the king, okay, the king, murdered innocent people. We have to learn Christ in life. When I lived in Hungary, I heard the story, the one neighbor, his, his neighbor got a new motorcycle, and this neighbor was jealous. So he, he saw the guy with the new motorcycle, so he called the tax office. And to tell tell the guy tell the tax office that the guy got a the guy got a new motorcycle. Did he pay the taxes on it? Really? Yeah, a neighbor. A neighbor. A jealousy. You know, fear. Yeah, what what society? What society? Call, where, what, what will we have? What will we have without the church? What will we have without correction? Without satisfaction? Like God is the only one that satisfies our soul. And if I don't worship God, and in our service tonight we do some singing, we listen, we see each other face to face, love each other. And we, we, we realize, we make a joke, we talk a little bit, we see God. We get released in love. You love me? I love you. You, you. I love you. You love me? I love you. We need it. Children are not getting it. Adults are not getting it. Teenagers, I, I, I heard 400% suicide increase. 400% in this past year with teenage suicides. Wow. Is that, is that an empty, lonely life, afraid? Are they, are they somehow, yes, that's what it is. What school are we in? We're in a school that the Lord has put us here. And, and maybe it's going to get worse. Maybe things are going to be really bad. Maybe there'll be food lines. Maybe there'll be so many bankruptcies coming spring. Maybe there'll be so many broken hearts, maybe broken marriages and broken lives. What do, you, what do you think? You think you can just survive without God? Do you think this world is your friend? Yeah, they, they, they don't care about you and me. The psalmist said, no one cares for my soul. That's what he said. But God does. Have you heard God whisper? in your spirit or say to you we have to have him talk to us and act in it and faith acting by faith Moses' parents saw he was a beautiful child by faith they put him in the river they gave him up to God and he goes downstream to Pharaoh's daughter and, they, and his sister Miriam is on the bank watching where he goes. And she, goes, and she says to the woman, the Pharaoh's daughter, she goes, you want me to get a, uh, 
a breastfeeder for the child, you know, somebody to feed the child. Yeah, so she goes gets her mother. <laughs> and Moses, get, Moses' mother gets her son back. You know, that's God. And, and this is the school we're in. It's about God. It's about God. That's the school we're in. It's not about the, the fear. It's not about these, this stuff. It's about God. And that, that's the story. That if we fear God, then we'll not fear evil. If we fear God, what's our future? I don't know. If some of you would be in a bread line one day, or me, maybe without this or that, and maybe the country collapsing somehow, they are saying all kinds of things, and I don't know, but I know this. We are the church. We are Christians. We have the spirit. We fear God. We have prayer meetings. We believe in God. We have conviction. We have a mission. You cannot stop it. That's our calling. Amen. Last verse. It says, And Pharaoh charged all the, saying, Every son that, oh, we did it already. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, there's a, it's that. Amen. God bless you. Oh, <laughs> ah. <laughs> yeah, praise the Lord. Take the offering right now. So uh, give with all the enthusiasm that you uh, just heard preach to you. Okay, can you give like the preacher just preached to you? Lord, please, we just ask you to bless this offering right now in Jesus' name. Amen.
close. Wow. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We are your church. We are your body. We are your ambassadors. And as we have heard tonight, we are going to continue to set our affections on things above. Uh, someone once said, well, you don't want to be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. We cannot be heavenly minded enough. Thank you for your thoughts toward us tonight. Thank you for the instruction we received tonight. Thank you for these great principles. And thank you, Lord, for making such a separation between us and this world that we are only living in for a short period of time. Continue to maintain our pilgrim's mentality. Remind us that we're sojourners. We have no continuing city here. We look for a, build, a city whose builder and maker is God. We thank you, Lord, for the instruction that you've given us here tonight. Continue to give us wisdom and discernment in the days to come. And again, anoint us for the mission that you've called us to undertake, which is to proclaim you throughout this world. We thank you for our church. Continue to bless all that will happen in the days and the weeks to come as we continue our celebration of the birth of our Savior. We thank you. We ask you to bless your people. Cover and protect us, Father. And thank you for your spirit. And thank you for this local church and our ministries around the world. Continue to bless them and strengthen them. We ask all of this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. And don't forget Wednesday night, the children's Christmas spectacular right here, 6 o'clock in our chapel. You won't want to miss that. God bless you. You're dismissed.